So, today uh, we have a seminar organized by the ECOSOC uh, group, which is the Ecology and Society Laboratory mm -hmm. in English. Uh, today uh, we have Andrzej Grobacic, almost, <laughs> from Berkeley University, and Jona Van Bosso, almost, mm -hmm. almost, <laughs> and the both uh, will present their perspectives on the concept of prefiguration. Uh, the, the title of the, of, of the seminar, as you see, is the Deep Politics of Prefiguration, Emancipation, Aesthetics and Neoliberalism in Action. Both have different, but sometimes similar uh, uh, positions regarding critical perspectives, regarding the concepts. I will not take much more of your time with the presentations. I don't know if Jonas wants to make any other um, wants to give any other information regarding the COSOC or if he wants to go straight forward to the... Um, just uh, maybe two informations. First, there is another uh, session of ECOSOC uh, next week, the 13th, on uh, mining uh, conflicts mm -hmm. in Brazil, um, which has the participation of uh, three or four PhD students who are doing research on these thematics. Um, a second on the question of uh, the encampment of Palestine, reminding that one of our last uh, things we did was a teach out session of ECOSOC uh, with the students of that camp. Um, now, let's start uh, with uh, uh, some things that I want to, some reflections I had on uh, the theme of uh, prefiguration and see where uh, this debate can lead us. Um, first, for those who don't know anything about the team, but um, I suppose most of you will who are, who are attending this seminar. Just a, a shortly a small definition of, uh, of what prefiguration is. Um, so prefiguration is a, is, a, is a tactic or a perspective on uh, social movement struggles um, with the, the idea that uh, there is a strong connection uh, between the ends and the means of a struggle of a social movement. It means that the end, the political goal of a certain uh, movement uh, is already reflected in the way how uh, the movement is struggling and this, so the, the methods um, reflect the ideal society or the goal society which it has in mind. So it has a certain moral um, action, a moral dimension, and it is often presented uh, within the literature and by activists who move it as some kind of an alternative towards other uh, political strategies for social movements on the left. Namely, on the one hand, vanguardism, uh, who has a projected idea about how the society and the political uh, goal uh, is, is, will be in the future and uh, then the means, uh, I would say, in a, in a Jesuit manner, uh, they, they, um, they all means are good to achieve this goal. Uh, and on the other hand, um, the reformist, social democratic reformist perspective, or even mutualist perspective, which uh, would say that um, the reforms are everything. So there is not uh, really a goal, or the, the goal is very far away. And uh, so we just need to, to incrementally adapt changes for the good in society. Um, prefiguration stands uh, in contrast with both, on one hand, on the, the means and the question of um, uh, vanguardism. So there is no idea of a vanguard. Like people make their own future and their own society. Uh, on the other hand, there is still an idea of an ideal society, political goal in this sense. Um, which contrasts with a reformist uh, perspective. It is um, a perspective which is um, often linked to direct action, um, also with traditions of um, anarchism and, uh, and council communism. And, but at the same time, it is a radical perspective, but it is also a perspective of changing within the society itself. So it is like the new society would be built within the shell of the old one. Um, so that is basically uh, some basic ideas to think uh, prefiguration. Um, we could say that in a, in, in a philosophical way, 
um, the, the origins of prefiguration have, uh, uh, in a certain sense, a religious origin. Um, we could trace it back to the ideas of early Christianity, where uh, the way how Christians had to behave in, in order to come to a, an utopia of the, 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 the paradise um, is already within the act of faith in the real life. So um, the, the, the way how prefiguration works is the same way how this form of Christianity works. So you have to do for the good as already being part of your way to paradise. Um, in the context of modernity, this kind of uh, more theological or religious perspective, of course, uh, gets a more materialist um, uh, feeling. Um, it, um, in, in a Marxist way, we could say that the critique uh, of uh, the heavens, uh, that is to say, doing the good because the world is bad and we have to get them to another uh, um, uh, place, an alternative by doing the good, uh, this critique becomes a critique of the real world, the social world, and thus a social critique. Um, in this sense, uh, there are some authors which defend that uh, the uh, Marxist perspective uh, based upon the idea of praxis is a first example of what is uh, prefigurative politics. It's to say that uh, the idea of socialism as it is uh, found or, or that is it developed by Marx in contrast to other kinds of socialism which uh, uh, existed uh, before uh, that were more idealist forms of socialism or utopianism, uh, say Erasmus or anything else, there's an idea of there is a paradise like in, in, a, in a Christian theological way which is developed within the mind and we have to achieve it somewhere. The idea of socialism from a Marxist perspective is a prefigurative one, in the sense that we try to find the way how to get in a new society within the actual society, the contradictions within the way how people, because of the political economic circumstances, uh, they form their own identities, their own form of social struggle, their own forms of solidarity, which are molded within the actual political economy of capitalism. Um, so, therefore, um, Marx as uh, Marx's theory of praxis as a uh, um, a form of prefiguration, um, and um, it is maybe also from this perspective on as Marx is a form of prefiguration that there is the possibility of dialogue within uh, traditions of council communism and anarchism um, here. A second, uh, I, I think within the, the Marxist um, tradition, the, the most well-known example uh, and development of the per uh, perspective of prefiguration uh, would be uh, Luxembourg's perspective on the mass strike. Um, so, in this sense, prefiguration is clearly um, linked to old class politics um, and um, it is very much linked to the structure of capitalism itself, at least when we take the perspective of the mass strike in Luxembourg. So. Um, is very much linked to the structure of capitalism, what is unique in capitalism, at least from a political Marxist perspective, like Alan Woods and so on, is, is a separation between uh, the two spheres of production um, and on the political sphere on the other hand. So the, the, the separation between the, the, the private and the, the political, between the economic and the political, um, where on the one hand you have uh, the economy where private relations between individuals um, um, and are, are um, organized with a market perspective um, through commodification and on the other hand you have a superstructure uh, and a different sphere where there is the possibility for political representation it's the sphere where democracy works where, um, which contrasts with the private sphere where you have the despotism of the workshop now how does the, mark and the mass strike with, uh, work within this uh, perspective, of course, is that the strike, in the first sense, is always a political, is always an economic struggle. So uh, it's a strike usually starts directly with uh, the the direct social needs of people, um, the the need for higher salaries, for uh, uh, more uh, better conditions of life, uh, to get um, uh, better working conditions, and so on. This kind of uh, struggles, let's say, within the economic sphere 
are politically transferred within capitalism to the political sphere, usually also um, not only by the consciousness of the workers themselves, that they need to uh, transfer these kind of needs in a political way, but also because of the reaction of the uh, state within capitalism itself. So there is a repression, there is a, um, um, the intervention of the police to defend uh, for example, private property, uh, there are laws which uh, contain political struggles and social struggles. So here there is a transfer from an economic struggle to an, uh, a political struggle and this is what happens uh, with the idea of a mass strike. So the mass strike or the general strike is the idea that um, the direct social needs uh, in a small struggle, in a small company, uh, through the contradictions of capitalism get generalized, go over sectors, go over countries and there, there is a generalization and a politicization of the strike. So from the moment that um, you have this generalization, this universalization, it is not anymore about uh, just the economistic um, needs or demands, but they start to be political demands, they start to be um, um, demands about um, the, the necessity of uh, changing society, changing government, uh, they start to be insurrectional and revolutionary. So that is the idea uh, of the politicization in a mass strike, uh, the economic crisis which is uh, transformed within a political crisis which has a revolutionary potential. Uh, what is important uh, within the perspective of Luxembourg on this, uh, on this mass strike is a strike is never made. Uh, that it's an ine inevitable consequence of social conditions. So in this sense, it is um, a, a different perspective, or, or at least there are some nuances with an, uh, an absolutely vanguardist perspective towards socialism. Um, and what is also important is that in the analysis of the, of the mass strike, is that through the development of the struggle, there is the necessity to create um, all the, the forms of struggle uh, that have a political content. So, um, for the organization of the strike, you need to, to build up strike community. You have to have political articulation between different sectors of society, between different uh, companies, and so on. So, you create kind of parallel institutions of decision making uh, which um, tend to be uh, horizontalist or federalist uh, in, in, in this sense. Um, and also, uh, these kind of decision structures have, throughout a strike, always, the, through the time it develops, also because of the time perspective, always need to, to take over or, or uh, have um, an implementation in different sectors of society. Um, if, I, if I take uh, the extreme example, uh, in uh, the strike in Belgium of uh, 6061, uh, it's a general strike in Belgium that took uh, around two months. Um, this uh, general strike which paralyzed the city, uh, the, the majority of the cities in Belgium. Uh, uh, it um, it had over the time, of course, uh, needed to, to to develop their own kind of public services because there was need uh, to distribute food. There was need to do, uh, do garbage collection. All these kind of things, which were paralyzed by the strike, they had to be done anyway because of the pro uh, the strikers themselves and the workers themselves had to survive. So this is um, during the process of the strike. There is a practical construction of a parallel state. So this is the idea um, that uh, that has much to do with kind of prefiguration. Is that the workers themselves drew during their method of struggle, they create their own state and their own institutions, their own uh, methods of uh, democratic decision making. Uh, for the plan, for economic planning, for uh, the um, uh, planning of security, for example, they, have, they are act effectively uh, developing a parallel form of law uh, as well. Now, uh, what um, does this um, perspective of Luxembourg on prefiguration, uh, what, what relevance has it today? Um, first of all, um, prefiguration has been a very important element in uh, recent uh, social movements, uh, particularly since uh, the global financial crisis and uh, its uh, importance uh, within uh, the Occupy movement, the encampment, the encampment movement following the Arab Spring, uh, the Indignados and so on. The idea of prefiguration has taken a very central uh, uh, 
positioned within the methods of struggle. But I will argue that there are uh, very important differences in uh, this uh, perspective of prefiguration and what was uh, what I was um, proposing before. Um, <clears throat> this uh, uh, Occupy movement or the Indignado movement, they uh, proposed the idea of real democracy as a form of prefiguration. Uh, it was uh, uh, something which emerged as an, uh, as an opposition towards the global financial crisis and particularly in Europe the austerity policies and took these ideas of austerity and the uh, economic um, uh, troubles uh, as a question of democracy. So um, they, they transformed it, so that the problem was started of course as a, as a problem of capitalism and of the, the policies of the European Union and so on, but it quickly became the, the main signifier of the movement was real democracy. Now we want um, another form of democracy, direct democracy, democratic practice, particularly against the corrupt elites, uh, the, uh, the castes, and so on. Here in Portugal, uh, we had a, a similar uh, movement. Uh, so, inspired by Indignado movement, we had the occupations, the acampadas that started in Rocio, also um, were present here in Coimbra for a few months in 2011. Um, a very specific. Um, a specific element of these movements is that uh, they um, had no or very uh, vague concrete demands. So this was not a protest movement that was against a specific measure that had to be recalled, but it was uh, more an idea of protest as a method um, and of, uh, of, um, of dialogue, say, let's say. Uh, it was a negation of the existing uh, forms of democracy, um, uh, which had a, a vague idea of what are the possible alternatives, which were also in a methodolog methodological way presented. It's a, a focus on participation, on immediacy, on diversity, on horizontality. Um, idea of not taking votes in this kind of uh, um, assemblies. Um, the idea of uh, that there should be no representation. Um, and uh, that everything should be uh, based on consensus. So um, in those movements it was uh, often preferable not to take any decision at all or taking hours of discussion without taking any decision than taking a decision that would be a vote which would be based on exclusion. So the idea of democratic non-exclusionism. Um, non um, on the other hand, this form of, uh, of democratic participation of the people protesting um, just because of their idea of method, they included the things that would, we would associate with, uh, with prefiguration. Um, so, the, um, most of the encampments, they, they uh, implemented measures of mutual aid, babysitting, culture and common studying, um, and even uh, ideas of community gardening and so on. So, is this uh, um, uh, an would this be like what some authors uh, contend as an anarcho council communist alternative to vanguard politics? Um, first of all, I, I want to, uh, to, to focus on uh, four key differences between the historical forms of prefiguration um, that are, let's say, based on class politics and the, uh, the, the forms we have seen uh, more recently. Uh, the first one is that uh, the uh, struggles around which uh, this prefiguration uh, forms is, are, are, um, are different. So the first ones are based on concrete needs, where the, uh, the forms of uh, democratic participation and so on are much more a consequence than they are uh, the starting point. In the, today's forms of protest, this is not so much that. So, so the, the idea of method and democratic decision making is the starting point uh, and where the needs should be discussed, let's say. Um, so there's a, a lack of concrete demands which would have been the, the starting point for the first one. The second one is that the, um, the historical prefiguration movements were based on an organized mass uh, where uh, the uh, contemporary forms of prefiguration uh, at least here in Europe, during the Occupy movement and so on, are based much more on a small minority, uh, whereas the first one were based upon 
um, their position within the system of production and also the way uh, how people were organized was in their workplaces with direct um, uh, link to their daily life while the new forms of prefiguration are usually a minority of students or precarious workers uh, unemployed a lot of times uh, but highly educated young people um, the third difference is that in the first form of uh, prefiguration there is, is totally based on collective organizations. Um, so it's parties, trade unions um, that articulate these forms of, uh, of struggle, uh, whereas the uh, contemporary forms are very much individualized and it's the, all based upon individual opinions which should be um, articulated and found a consensus with, between each other. Um, so there is a, an emphasis on independency of individuals that should be detached from hierarchies and, and organizations in which they uh, eventually could be part of. Um, and the, the fourth difference is that the, the first uh, or the historical form of prefiguration is very much based on the idea of control of means of production. It's like what I was saying, the organization is on the working sphere itself. And uh, that's the starting point where the uh, contemporary forms of, uh, of prefiguration are much more based on the idea of occupation of the public space uh, and discourse. So the two different spheres of capitalism, the first historical one was on the uh, economic <coughs> sphere, uh, the sphere of production. The other one is on the superstructural sphere of, um, of public space and discourse and very much focused on an idea of media attention. I would contend this, uh, therefore, that uh, the contemporary forms of prefiguration as a form of protest and opposition, they contend um, uh, very specific elements that are um, uh, part of the neoliberal hegemony. Uh, which is, it's, uh, it's in, in a certain sense ironic that um, the, these protest movements which are a sign of um, neoliberalism in decline, of a, a global capitalism which is passing a, a very serious crisis, that the protest movements are very clearly dominated by a neoliberal hegemony. Um, in, um, I, I think this is, uh, can be um, seen in, in different uh, uh, elements, namely on uh, the, the focus on method rather than goal. So the idea that the method is most the democratic method is most important than the political alternative um, is, in a sense, a consequence of the still um, the post-history uh, um, era of, uh, of neoliberalism, where there is no more grand narratives and there is no more alternatives uh, in a in a Thatcher way. So it's totally Fukuyama. Um, the the then there is um, the uh, that the protest is restricted to a symbolic moral statement uh, rather than the political articulation for a wider change. So um, the, 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 the focus of the, the protest is, like I said, just in the public sphere, there is no uh, attempt or to create a power relationship that is that has the potential to change the system. Uh, it is rather a form of enactment uh, of theater. Um, and then the, the last element is that there is a um, uh, um, um, dimension of depolitization within the movement in the sense that it's much more focused on consensus and it doesn't leave the possibility for conflict um, because all individuals, no matter where, which class or everything uh, that uh, is, is accepted as equal, as an equal partner and should be uh, not, not even equal partner, it's a, an essential partner, so it should be included. Um, uh, there is no possibility of a majority taking a position towards someone else. Uh, then also the focus on citizenship rather than on class, uh, on um, uh, this, the, the power position disappears, and also um, the very strong position of anti-party and anti-ideology positions within uh, many of those movements. So, um, to conclude, um, if uh, prefiguration is to have a, an important uh, aspect in, uh, in still today in, in, in towards the strategy to, to change 
um, the world for the better, I think there's two things that need to happen. On the one hand, I think that class organizations need to be, to incorporate and to be open again about the idea of refiguration, namely as a perspective against the bureaucratization of, uh, of the um, organizations against also the more reformist perspective within capitalism rather than to project an alternative society um, beyond capitalism. And on the other hand, the new, the new social movements uh, need to link prefiguration back to the uh, idea of class and on political economy. Thank you, Yanis. Andres. You just, I was starting, I started to write at some point because you have this major community gardens with such a disdain. It reminded me of a debate between Eric Musam, who was a famous German anarchist, a student of even more famous Gustav Landau, who, when he was, before, shortly before he was killed in the German council movement in 1919, he was having this huge debate with a spontaneous faction within the anarchist movement, and he told them, Landauer never talked about rabbit farms. He talked about collective struggle, collective forms of struggle. He was trying to signal that there is a different kind of prefigurative forms of organ organization and organizing. And you know, in many ways, it really is, and I will try to be conversational and even slightly biographical. The way that I encountered configuration was when I joined what was called the Belgrade Libertarian Movement in Serbia. And I was, a, I was actually 13 years old, so very young, and very impressionable. And I remember my teacher, mentor, really a beautiful Yugoslav anarchist by the name of Trivo Injic. He told me, if you want to understand anarchism, just think about this. Think about this phrase, anarchism is approximation of freedom by the means of freedom themselves. And I absolutely loved that phrase and I love the definition. And later on, many, many years later, I figured out, and I don't know how I found out, it actually came from Ernst Bloch. And Bloch said actually in the same, I think it was Spirit of Utopia, mm -hmm. said something very interesting, also in this sense of what today I guess we would call prefigurative, which was we have to create new knowledge and new philosophy. After Marx, knowledge, we never use the term figurative, but knowledge is education of hope, knowledge is commitment to the future, and knowledge is here for tomorrow. And I hope all knowledge is not at all. It's a clumsy translation, but basically what means prefigurative, I think is slightly different from Jonas will tell me how much it corresponds with what he thinks prefigurative is. Prefigurative for me, let me say this immediately at the beginning, uh, is a necessity of political thinking today. So it's not optional, it's absolutely necessary. It's either prefigurative or it's draconian. It's, and I will explain what I mean by draconian. So, and I don't think we have more time to waste on draconian bureaucratic centralized solutions and methods of struggle. But again, when I was fragile age of 13, we were made to read all sorts of books. Stepanyak, the Russian populist, was one underground Russia. Many of us were kids, we wanted to do armed struggle. They gave us the book, read this, and then when we realized what armed struggle entailed, we still know, maybe not, they gave us another book. And uh, we started reading about Spanish Revolution. And Spanish Revolution was this for any anarchist or libertarian communist is this go-to place in your education as a militant. Because what you do really is you read about people like Augustin Sushi, Sushi, who said something like, social transformation is what anarchists are all about. First social transformation in the pre-revolutionary period, then social construction in the period after the revolution. And then there was, of course, Rudolf Rocker, who we all loved, and I don't know how Familiar these names are in Portugal, Rudolf Rocker. So he's uh, what you might call the founding figure of anarcho-syndicalism as a particular movement within anarchism, as a particular set of tactics within anarchism. And he said famously that we need to create in pre-revolutionary period, not only ideas, but the facts of the future themselves by embodying in the structure of our organization 
the kind of future society that we would like to see tomorrow. So Rudolf Rocker inspired greatly Noam Chomsky and the whole anarcho-syndicalist tradition that emerged in the United States that was organized around the industrial workers of the world, or the Bombers, who famously said, we need to build the new world within the shell of the old world, as I think you call it. So these were some ideas, or these were my encounters early with prefigurative thinking. The earliest statement that I have found that we might call prefigurative in socialist literature is Chernyshevsky. Chernyshevsky in Stodielat writes at some point, imagine the future, it is beautiful. The present will be beautiful only as much we can bring the ideas, he said, the things from the future into the present. So to the extent that we can transfer the things of the future in the present, the future will be beautiful. And that is the first time that I encountered the prefigurative sentiment in socialist literature. When I started looking for prefigurative as a term, as a concept, the first time, and again, this is according to my investigation, but they completely wrong, was actually Cornelius Castoriadis in 1973, who wrote in his famous piece called Hungarian Source about, I think it was published in Tilos journal that used to exist then, uh, he said something like, I don't care about Egyptian revolution of 3,000, or Egyptian society of 3,000 years, I care about Hungarian society, because in that moment, the inherited ideas of revolution and politics were broken, and a completely new society was prefigured. And there was something problematic, and I would agree with you on this here with this statement. There is some kind of an unruly spontaneity almost that you can read between the lines. The second time that I read, and I think this is how the term prefigurative actually entered politics, or entered our vocabulary about politics is this guy Karl Marx. Karl Marx wrote a piece called Prefigurative Communism or Marxism, Prefigurative Communism and the Problem of Workers' Control. It was published in 1970s. Do you know this piece? No. He is widely credited for introducing the term prefigurative. And he defines it like this. I thought this would be useful to share. Uh, in the past century, the most direct attack on statist Marxism has come from what might be called the prefigurative tradition, which begins with the 19th century anarchists and includes the syndicalists, council communists, and the new left. By prefigurative, I mean the embodiment with the ongoing political practice of a movement of those forms of social relations, decision-making, culture, and human experience that are the ultimate goal. Developing mainly outside of Marxism, which I don't think it was true, it produced a critique of bureaucratic domination and a vision of revolutionary democracy that Marxism generally lacked. Again, it depends which Marxism. Yet, wherever it was not destroyed by the bourgeois state or by organized Marxist parties, it fell prey to its own spontaneity or wound up absorbed into established trade union, party, or state institutions. These are its historical limitations. Also, this was, I think, Probably the definition of prefigurative politics that I would agree with. I don't know, Jonas, what do you think? Does it capture the essence of what you were? No. So, in that sense, I think this is uh, useful. Uh, later on, it was used by new, new social movement theories, Billy Price and many others, and it has a history of its own. I would actually try to propose a way out of the predicament, conceptual but also political predicament that Jonas has described uh, very accurately, by making a distinction between prefiguration, prefigurative struggles, prefigurative organizing, and prefigurative vision, which would be, for me, something completely different. It would also correspond to a similarly annoying term of horizontalism, where I would make a similar intervention and say that there is a big difference between the concept of horizontality of horizontal, which is a part of collective self-activity that we see in many struggles, not all of them, and also the term horizontalism, like prefigurativism, which would de denote a certain kind of anti-ideological ideology. 
separation of form from content, separation of form and method from the political center, separation of all of these things as sets of practices from the revolutionary center, political center, and also create all sorts of problems that are very rarely or sometimes completely non-anarchist, non-libertarian Marxist. And you have probably noticed that I'm using these terms together. I think that anarchism and libertarian Marxism belong to the same family. I speak either of libertarian socialism or libertarian communism. So this is why I would not agree that Marxism was not prefigurative. But I would say definitely that anarchism and Marxism of the best kind, left-wing Marxism, were not prefigurative best. They were not an anti-ideological ideology. They were not a set of practices divorced from political center. But also, I think it would be too easy not to understand the mistakes and flaws, conceptual and political, that people who participated in, say, Occupy movements or global square movements in Europe or many civil movements in Latin America were making. So where are they coming from? For me, the year of 1848 is absolutely decisive. This is the year of the World Revolution that was both nationalist, well, national, but also socialist, radical. And it created what Emmanuel Wallerstein called the geoculture of capitalist modernity or modern capitalist world system. What that means is that created three ideologies. First one was centrist liberalism, which soon became dominant. Second one was conservatism, and the third one was, of course, radicalism, what would become in later decades the anti systemic movement. Now, the anti systemic movement had a split almost from the very beginning that was negotiated in the series of debates. Debates were mostly around three things. First thing was the question of the state. There was a debate should we take the power of the state, or should we, as the Spanish anarchists, for example, advocated, and many others, create work of social transformation, education, this was also the proposal of Rosa Luxemburg, we used the term direct apprenticeship in direct democracy. So do we dissolve the state and socialize power, or do we take the power of the state, or smash the state, or feed the state as a thingified object? And they said no. The Jacobin tendency, which is a tendency that is bureaucratic centralist, tendency that insisted on taking over the power of the state, or as we used to say in Yugoslavia, first we take the state, then we create socialist humanities. Socialist humanity, we call it the two-step strategy. Right? And uh, that was more efficient. And the Jacobin idea, since the French Revolution, was always about centralization, bureaucratic centralism, and especially annoying, this complete lack of any belief in the knowledge and intelligence of the crowds and masses. So instead of that, we received revolutionary bureaucrats. And that was the first thing that became extremely problematic in this debate between, again, Debate was interesting because it was happening both in socialist movements and in anti-colonial movements, or between cultural and political nationalists, and between anarchists and uh, libertarian Marxists and the Jacobins on the other side. So the second debate was even more important, I think, for today, which was the debate about universal, homogenous, revolutionary suffrage. And that's a very problematic debate, and this is where I think Jonas and I are probably going to disagree. So the idea of universalizing radical subjectivity, capturing it in one revolutionary subject, which was done in the 19th century and early 20th century as mostly masculine, industrial proletariat, meaning industrial working proletariat, right, was extremely problematic. Same was done on the side of nationalist movement, which created similarly reified theory of the people. Right? And I think this is something where you can see, and I will come back to this, but lots of displeasure that I was a witness at, at Occupy Oakland, came from this historical exclusion of certain subjectivities, meaning women, and so on and so forth, and many others, from the idea 
of what it means to be a revolutionary subject. And the third thing, of course, and that was the debate was probably most vicious between federalists and Jacobins, was around the means of organization. Should we create a bureaucratically controlled, supervised, centralized organization? Or should we have more patience, put more and more faith in spontaneous uh, movements and spontaneous intelligence of the movements? And that was the debate in three steps that actually never went away. Divided anti-systemic movements led to the Russian Revolution of 1917, in which the Jacobins won out the Bolsheviks. Uh, Bolsheviks, for me, represent the right wing of Marxism, and it goes for all Bolsheviks, so from Lenin to Stalin, including Trotsky. Then it went on all the way to the Great Revolution of 1968, another world revolution because it affected the entire world in the period between 19. 65 and 1972, in which the two-step strategy of taking over the state and then transforming humanity and of revolutionary <coughs> democracy receives huge criticism. It was also a time of revival of prefigurative politics. Now, prefigurative politics that they were referring to in those days was not, I think, the performative uh, perf politics that, we, that Jonas was talking about. <coughs> referring to the main and most important prefigurative revolutions, which included, let just stick to, to 20th century uh, Russian Revolution at the very beginning, because it was captured and hijacked by the, by the Jacobins. After that, the German Council Movement. And maybe a year before that, the Italian Council Movement. So between 1918 and 1920. These were the three most important prefigurative revolutions before the Spanish Revolution that happened in 1936. Behind the prefigurative Spanish Revolution, there were years, literally decades actually, of creating, especially in the countryside, but also in Barcelona and other places, uh, self-education, building the capacity, as it was told, of the proletariat, understood in a very broad sense, creating what was called the practical schools of anarchism, the living germs of the future society is another term that was used, and these anticipatory institutions created of social transformation that preceded social construction that were announced in 1931 Congress in Saragossa and 1936 Congress in Madrid, created what was, I think, the most elaborate, most successful revolutionary movement of the uh, 20th century, the Spanish, Spanish Revolution. Now, 1968, emerged a new confrontation between uh, the Jacobins and the Federalists, or the prefigurative ways of organizing, and it was really interesting because this is the time, I think, when what was at that time called extreme subjectivism emerged. Andre Gotz famously wrote, we cannot have communism without communist lifestyles. We cannot have communism without communist culture. We cannot have communism, but at the same time, we cannot have communist lifestyleism or lifestyle or a culture that is emerging out of capitalism division of labor and out of capitalist society and technology. Lifestyle became extremely important. What uh, Wallerstein and many others called the forgotten peoples, women, ethnic minorities, peasants, or other subjects that were excluded from the mythical industrial working class, came back. Revolution was, indeed, uh, anti-statist, but the idea of revolution was also very much about reinventing everyday life. We have the situationists, we have the uh, feminist movements, we have all sorts of movements that were pointing out that there is absolutely nothing that we can do about capitalism defined as subjugation of social reproduction, of human and non-human life, to production of value expressed by money. There is nothing else that we can do but organize or begin our organizing from the perspective of everyday life. 
And this is something that exploded in the United States, and that's the context that I'm very familiar with. And you had people like peacekeepers. Peacekeepers were mostly an anarchist, early anarchist organization influenced by Quakerism, who brought the idea of consensus to a guy by the name of James Lawson to the SNCC. SNCC was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, it was one of the main groups of the civil rights movement, where Stockton to Carmichael and many others came from. They were making decisions by consensus. The same Quakerism that anarchists of that period uh, were promoting came from there to the movement for new society, led among others by George Lakey, and from there to places like uh, well, feminist consciousness raising movement had a separate but very similar trajectory, and finally the direct action movement around anti-nuclear movements, Clank Shell Alliance in the 1970s and then 1980s. Through that, consensus, spokes, uh, councils, and what was called affinity groups, taken from the language of the Spanish Revolution, actually went to uh, what was to become anti-nuclearization movement in the 1990s, and finally the Occupy movements. So it was a very similar and a very kind of clear trajectory. Now, can I have a few more minutes? How many? Don't make me two, three, make three. Back. two, three. Two, three. So, uh, I wanted to come back to what I think is actually the solution to the problem of configurative politics given in the same article that coined the term by Karl Box again, configurative communism. He says here, and I am in absolute agreement, maybe not with the language, but the way that he talks about it, he says, what is required and what the entire prefigurative strategy lacks, and again, prefigurative strategy that he's referring to is the anarchist revolution and councilist revolution, right? What is required, what the entire prefigurative strategy lacks, is a merging of spontaneism and the external element. I was first confused by external element because it sounded a little bit too vanguardist, but then he actually goes on to clarify, and he says, since emancipatory goals can be fully carried out only through local structures, it is these organs, rather than the party state, that must shape the revolutionary process. Centralized structures would not be superimposed upon mass struggles, but would emerge out of these struggles as coordinating mechanisms. Only popular institutions in every sphere of daily existence where democratic impulses can be most completely realized can fight off the repressive incursions of bureaucratic centralism and activate collective involvement that is the life force of revolutionary practice. So external elements, for him, are organs of coordination, coordinating mechanisms that he identifies, and I actually think that he is completely right, were missing in the former prefigurative struggles. And I will just finish by saying that the most interesting question in all of this, and this has been something that I have been developing with a friend whose name is Anna Dinerstein, uh, who is an autonomous Marxist and who wrote a beautiful book, The Art of Organizing Hope, in Argentina. And uh, we were thinking about how to bypass this whole very boring conversation between either we do the state, either the state, or autonomy. It didn't make much sense. So what we came up with is how to create a framework for understanding prefigurative struggles, beginning with the necessity of prefigurative struggles. The idea is that prefigurative struggles are actually much more complex and messy than the people who call themselves horizontalists or prefigurativists would have it. In order to understand them, we actually have to start with the question of state. How does the state actually translate, is the term that we use, translate the struggles that we create, prefigurative struggles, into the grammar of representation, repression, integration, cooperation. How can we actually produce surplus possibilities, meaning access that is not untranslatable? How can we produce something that cannot be translated by straight structures? And what are the modes of actual prefigurative organizing in particular situation? So we identified four. First one is refusal. 
And there was something very interesting in South America recently, and you can really follow this in this. It was called, I think, Reclaim the Street in Johannesburg. It was an urban occupation. So, refusal. What they did was to refuse whatever were the city regulations and to occupy the space that was there. Second one that we insisted is really important is creation. Because each one of these prefigurative struggles creates some new and institutes some new political practices, new culture of struggles, something new. In the case of this uh, interesting movement in Johannesburg, it was about the <coughs> kind of neighborhood culture of struggle and many different ideas they have created. Third, and I think this one is absolutely crucial, is contradictions. Contradictions is something that people who write about horizontalism and prefigurativism never really talk about. And there are two main kinds of contradictions. First is objective contradiction. That is usually the state. The state is a form of mediation of social struggles. And this is probably also very honest and myself disagree. Because what state is for me, it's a political form of capitalism. It's a form of social existence of capitalism. It's a form, it's very Hegelian, a form of social mediation. That is objective. There's also a subjective one, which was very clear in this movement that I just mentioned, which is fight between those people who are very quick to enter into conversation with state. It could be trade unions, it could be people who have different reformist mindset, it could be people who are making deals with the state. It doesn't matter. That's a subjective mediation. That's a really big problem in shaping and breaking the radical subjectivity, complicating radical subjectivity. And finally, there is the excess. These are the surplus possibilities. Everything that we are able to produce that is not translatable by the state. So, what we need to do is not to ditch prefigurative or prefigurative struggles or prefigurative politics. But to actually understand prefigurative politics in much open-ended way, bring in contradiction, start to realize what is this untranslatable process of surplus, excess, how to actually nourish it, how to create it, and how to distance ourselves from rather sterile debates, should we engage with the state or not. Because one way or another, you have to engage with the state. We better find a way of doing that that actually honors the best moments of our Thank you so much. Do you anticipate that um, I would bring the issue of state to, to my comments and to the questions? Exactly because um, one, as a Marxist, one of our critiques of uh, this idea of configuration is actually some, sometimes it's uh, inability or uh, refusal to uh, confront uh, and seize, confront, seize, transform the states and actually operate outside it. Yet it also means that there is a discussion about what is the state and how the movements relate to the state and the, and the conception that they have to the state. So this was one of the questions that I had for both of you, which is how both of you perceive actually the state, um, considering that we cannot see the state uh, in an universal way. Um, for example, Jonas talks about the prefiguration and uses the examples of the social movements in the United States, the Republic of Venezuela, and others in Portugal. And the critiques that Jonas makes to these um, movements are quite totally agree with, uh, with, um, with his analysis and his critiques, um, they actually lacked the ability, they kind of generalized this idea that we wanted some kind of new democracy, but they weren't able to uh, uh, express what democracy they were against. They weren't able to say we're against the bourgeois democracy, we're against the bourgeois democracy that organizes the state, around a technocratic, bureaucratic apparatus uh, of, of privileges. And so it ended up being something that was outside uh, the state, although with uh, good uh, initiatives when it came to the experiments of community-based uh, solidarity networks, 
creation of alternative spaces, which was also very important because within the social movement and within the labor movement, and this is a question for you, Jonas, why you chose, why you kept bringing, or why you decided to bring the, the example of strikes these days, when strikes these days have become one of the less effective uh, means of, of struggle for the working class, considering that the forms of capital accumulation have become much more complex, that it's not just by interrupting the process of production that we are able to actually achieve uh, the, the break into the, the capitalist process of accumulation. So I wonder why you kept uh, bringing the, the, um, the question of, of strikes into, <coughs> as an example. Of, um, I don't. I didn't know if it was an historical account of yours. You are still focusing on strikes as a, as a strategy that we should have as the heart of, as the center of our uh, strategies and tactics. Um, I also wanted to say that <coughs> I struggle a lot with this idea of uh, uh, prefiguration if it's not located, situated, historically, materially um, contextualized. Uh, material conditions don't care about our idealism. No matter what, how much we experiment, material conditions don't care about it. So we have to also place our um, practices and alternatives within the reality of <coughs> the, material, the material world, the social relations of productions where we are. It's different to look at the Zapatist movement and how they are facing the state, which the Mexican state, which is, in my perspective, not, not a state. <laughs> if we compare and we think about like a Portuguese or a European state, it's not the same. It's not in this, it doesn't work the same way. The, the means and the goals of the state in Mexico are not the same as in uh, Europe, um, in to some extent, uh, considering all the violence, colonialism, internal colonialism, uh, marches, and narco mm -hmm. within, uh, the, within, within Mexico today. So, I wanted also to make this that to analyze concept of configuration, we actually need the lens of uh, historical dialectic materialism. And for that, I feel that it was really nice that you <laughs> talked about, uh, you bring the, the concept of, of, of Bloch, Bloch, mm -hmm. of Bloch, because I actually believe that the, con the concept of concrete utopias mm -hmm. is much more interesting when it comes to kind of translate what both of you mm -hmm. have tried to say because at the end I believe that both you uh, both of you are aiming at, at the, the same the same end but are mobilizing different uh, concepts and different intellectual um, tools and I would like to bring the, the idea of concrete utopias first one uh, first of all because the concrete utopia, has uh, the ability, has an ability of anticipatory thinking and action, which in this sense brings elements of the future into the present, and in this sense it's aligned with prefigurative politics, but also encourages Marxism uh, to see value in these immediate transformative practices. The other is the integration of imagination that Block means not the role of imagination, the role of art, the role of culture in shaping f uh, future possibilities. Um, this can also enrich prefigurative politics with deeper theoretical and cultural dimensions, while also reminding Marxism that we need to inspire and mobilize true visionary ideas. Uh, and of course, the concept of hope and uh, agency, but most of it, hope, considering that um, the block concept has fostered the possibility and the empowerment that is crucial for both 
uh, prefigurative and Marxist endeavors. So, uh, by reinforcing the idea that transformative change is achievable through a combination of immediate practices and a long-term revolutionary strategies, which I believe will some kind of sums up what what your was your final uh, thought about it. That um, the way Jonas approaches prefigurative the concept of prefigurative, it's not uh, doesn't make. Um, uh, no faz justice ao conceito. Doesn't make um, justice. Doesn't make justice to some of some of the practices that are on of preferred politics, such as like uh, Andre just uh, bring up. So um, I think that block concepts of utopias can actually offer a unified framework. Uh, highlighting the importance of participatory practice, imagination, and dialectical process approach to social transformation. So this is my idea, my comments to both uh, to both of you. But if, again, I would like to bring the discussion of state, uh, not because I'm kept having the the, the, the idea that uh, the the. No, I actually do. I actually think we need to seize the state. And I actually think we need to, to transform it. So how how can how can we do it and how can prefiguration help us do that without just being creates or being spaces for experiment on alternative worlds that never end up resulting in any revolutionary and change. <laughs>